today we're going to talk about bringing uh, trusted data on chain, proof of reserve stuff. Uh, I'm Noah Buxton. I'm a partner at Armanino LLP. We're a large public accounting firm, top 20 uh, by revenue in the US and uh, in business since 1969. So the firm does, with its 2,000, 2,500 people, does a lot of traditional accounting services. Uh, I lead our blockchain and digital assets practice, which is a key initiative for the firm, something that we've been doing uh, for a while now, actually. So uh, on accident in 2014, when we took on the Coinbase financial statement audit, 2014 to 2018, and uh, more deliberately since 2019, when we really put a focus and invested uh, in this space to serve crypto companies. And so today we do a lot of different things. We serve just about every kind of constituent you have in the crypto space, from crypto funds, miners and stakers, uh, large exchange audits, the list goes on, token projects, etc. So the other more innovative stuff that we do is uh, build new technology. So try and, advanced, uh, try and advance the trust and transparency space. So for us, that's a product called Trust Explorer, and it's actually the world's first real-time audit or real-time attest platform. So first time a CPA firm is able to sign off on data in effectively real-time and make that reporting downloadable to the public. Uh, so we do that for a number of issuers. About $40 billion, though, today is under a test under uh, Trust Explorer. So um, yeah, let's get into it. The things I want to cover today are trust, right? How do we understand sort of trust models in this new and quickly changing space? Uh, certainly, you all know that some trust issues abound, whether you want to call them security issues or trust issues or transparency issues. They're certainly prevalent in today's uh, crypto markets. Um, and so then let's talk about what the solution set is, right? And, and uh, there's been announced at the conference already, uh, you know, on-chain proof of reserves, true USD actually publishing to Chainlink um, proof of reserves data. So we'll get into that a little bit more. So when we think about trust, I mean, generally, this, the thesis I have uh, and that we have at the firm is that this is inevitable. Uh, the amount of capital and human resources being put into the space uh, creates a forward momentum that I don't think can really be stopped, right? So uh, there's a lot of investment and knowledge going to the space that isn't reflected in market pricing, right? The market doesn't have this priced in, I don't think. Um, and I think of this as like entropy versus organization too, right? Entropy being this natural process of something falling to a state of disorder unless energy is put in over and above to organize or formalize or um, formulate. So. Uh, tokenization wins uh, and fights entropy because we have on-chain markets and on-chain data that can be uh, better, faster, right? Uh, be more disintermediated, uh, more fair, more transparent, more orderly. Um, and so, you know, how do we really get there, though? We have to solve trust uh, issues in these markets. And so I wanted to give a really broad framework. Uh, it's a bit of 101, but it kind of resets us as to what we're talking about. So what are the conditions for a market, right? We all need a buyer and a seller. Uh, well, it's more than that, though, isn't it? Because a buyer and a seller market could be bartering. It could be a flash market. It could be uh, not sustainable, right? So what we really need for a market is a second layer, which is infrastructure. Um, and those things include liquidity and leverage, right? They include the uniformity of financial products. They include uh, security and settlement, um, and to some extent, the stability of purchasing power that can access that market. But more over that, we actually need more than that. If we want markets that are fair and orderly and sustained and predictable um, and reliable, we need information. And so there's a lot of things that can go into information in a market, but you can think of them as price discovery and valuation. You could think of fairness, right? Information that can create fairness in these markets to all participants. Uh, certainly, there's always going to be arbitrage opportunities, but generally, we think of markets that we would want to access being right fair. Transparency, um, potentially even a neutral arbiter. Um, but what we focus on today is transparency. We think that this is a big gap in crypto markets uh, and specifically hinders the tokenization use cases uh, that are potentially so powerful. So these trust issues abound. Um, you know, transparency overall in this space is low, right? And we all know at the base case that is bad for adoption, it's bad for investors. Uh, but low transparency also drives regulatory scrutiny, even talk of prohibition, uh, things that are ultimately uh, won't allow us to form this market. Um, and so even more than that, on the sort of the bleeding edge, lack of on-chain data for protocols um, really means that we can't fully automate. We can't fully realize the promise of automated market making of DeFi protocols, um, which again, can disrupt capital markets um, and be incredible venues for trade. 
Um, so the current state of play, uh, you know, this is kind of demystifying maybe or thinking about sort of these trust models that are prevalent or possible in today's markets, right? So one question is, is the company solvent, right? And so how do we get to answer that question? In today's market, it's a financial statement audit. This is what regulators want to see on an annual basis and deliver it three months later. Um, but you know, this really gives in some ways actually limited insight, uh, depending on the reader, to the company. Um, they're infrequent, of course. I just told you this is a yearly rolling cadence, right? So what about all the 364 days in between? Um, you know, even if there's another key issue here for crypto and tokenized assets specifically, is that even if you go and audit the company, uh, these may be off balance sheet assets. These may be things that are footnotes essentially to the auditor and get limited scrutiny. And to be clear about that, that could be custodial exchange balances, right? It could be your balance at Kraken or Coinbase. It's really an off balance sheet item. Um, and similarly, for a token issuer, uh, this could be an off balance sheet item as well, right? The, the assets that they custody to back the token that they've issued. And so the vehicle to, or the, the next question is okay, well, is that token backed? Where is the collateral, right? And the way that we answer that, again, with somewhat traditional assurance measures, is periodic attestations or reports from independent uh, public accountants over collateral reserves. And so we do a lot of this reporting today. And it can kind of follow different cadences. But uh, the truth is, it's really very limitedly applied. Right? If you look across what has been tokenized today, even stable coins as just a segment, uh, there's some diversity in practice. The, the reporting isn't necessarily uniform. And it's not widely applied, right? So a few of the top issuers produce this reporting. Um, and down, down from there, there's not a lot of transparency. Um, and there's tons of room for improvement in this model. If you just think about the attest model, it is powerful. It is focused on collateral. And there's a lot of room for improvement. So I told you about Trust Explorer. We've been doing this in a real-time way, right? So we've effectively taken the assurance window from 365 days, let's say, down to a possible 30 seconds by integrating with the blockchain to look at circulating supply of a token and integrating um, via API to custodians or banks. Uh, again, though, that's somewhat limited. Uh, when you think about an automated protocol, uh, it's not going to go read a report, right? There's a human readable form of this that the compliance department and counterparty sort of agreements they like, right? And it, it is a layer of trust. It is a trust model that's important but there can be more. So how do protocols think about collateral reserves? How can they build uh, protocols with this information? And so this is exactly what Chainlink is doing uh, by pushing uh, and putting resources into this proof of reserves uh, use case, right? Actually building adapters, working with companies to bring collateral reserve data on chain. And we're doing that too, right? Uh, it, it requires uh, partners to do this. So on-chain proof of reserves is the vehicle here to get protocols the information that they need. Um, this is the new frontier. So uh, one point that I also make is that it requires, in some cases, data aggregation, right? And that um, can be done in a number of ways, but we think is a sort of a middleware of trust and transparency that a, a trusted and reputable firm like Armanino can be very involved in that, right? We have the, we have the technology, we can apply um, different measures of scrutiny to the data before it goes on chain. Um, and I think that that's ultimately an advance, right? That's a, a step forward in bringing more of this type of reserves data on chain. All right. So, the other thing is that this framework is written, and I don't think a lot of people know that, right? We talk in the space about you know, how things are a little bit opaque and gray areas and regulators aren't being clear. Um, that is true from the regulatory sort of top-down perspective. Um, it's also true that you know, sort of uh, firms and standard-setting bodies are doing work in the space. So we participated in a, um, a working group uh, with the Digital Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we were a lead author on that work, and there's some other large accounting firms and law firms involved with the Digital Chamber. And what we produced was a, de a definitional framework and a taxonomy to understand tokenized assets, or as we called them, sort of crypto collateralized claims, right? They could be a token, they could be an account balance, but anyway, you have an asset liability mismatch type problem that needs to be solved. And so you can see these general buckets of asset-backed tokens, crypto platform account liabilities, think exchanges, lending, um, and then cryptocurrency security instruments, right, which can be traded notes uh, on traditional markets that are backed by crypto um, or some hedge of crypto. And so this framework, I think, is we, we 
built it to be wide enough and broad enough so that things could plug into it. I guess that's the idea of a framework, right? It should be somewhat all-encompassing. We can't see around every corner, but we do think that this is a very meaningful framework. So we encourage you guys to, uh, to check this out. Uh, we think it gives a lot of history of proof of reserves and also some notes on future application and how firms and uh, other participants can actually do this work. Um, so what are the models? Uh, I won't read these to you, but I feel like they're just about every important model in the tokenization and, and crypto market space, right? From stable coins all the way to cross-chain bridges, there are trust gaps that can be solved. Um, and they, uh, they take you know, different uh, methodologies to solve. But if you think about stable coins, right, you've got a token and you've got cash or cash equivalents or securities, even corporate debt potentially, backing up that dollar value of the token to maintain redeemability of that token and also maintain its peg uh, to the fiat measure or a USD. Um, commodity tokens, similarly, right? Tokenized gold, right? Put gold in the vault and a, and a token that tracks its value. It's a tracking token, you could say. Uh, some are physically settled. Um, security tokens, these can be many different things. Uh, and I think there is a fair class of security tokens, right? Which are an LP share in a business or a fund, uh, a VC interest, for instance. Spice VC, I think, was the first to tokenize a VC interest. Definitely a security token. Um, and then wrapped in bridge tokens, where the asset liability mismatch is between actually two things on chain. Maybe an easier problem to solve, but still a transparency gap, right? Information in two places, not easily visible. So all of these, again, have, the, have these gaps. So what does the solution set look like? Um, I mean, simply put, the token issuer uh, can offer real-time information to prove reserves, right? And they can do it themselves. They can do it in a lightweight way through a third party to aggregate data, like Armanino, um, or directly with Chainlink through some off-chain computation and, and an adapter provided. Um, so there are multiple different models. But um, again, to restate this point, data aggregation is almost always necessary when you have multi-custodians or multi-asset sources. Um, yeah, and so this data can then be av made available on-chain uh, via the Chainlink Oracle network. And what's the result? The result is you know, potentially that issuers' contract can actually be hard-coded and prevented from minting. So this is something that we'll start to call the mint lock, right? I hope that that term sort of uh, gets, gets more widely used because this is an incredible, incredibly powerful function, right, where the contract that is responsible for issuing or burning new tokens, uh, depending on deposit um, or withdrawal, right, in the stablecoin use case, can actually be functionally prevented from minting more tokens than it has dollar reserves for. Uh, in the accounting world, we call these controls, right? And that is a very, very strong control. It's a system-based application control um, that is open source, everyone can look at, everyone can validate. Um, you know, there's some other opportunities too. I said on the panel earlier that, you know, there's people sitting in front of me that are frankly a lot smarter than I am and have great ideas. So I think once the information is there, things can be built on top of it, right? This is just the foundation, right? But we do know that Mintlock is a potential and is going to be actually in production with true USD. So the first stablecoin issuer uh, to do this, right? Um, and I think there's other cool things. Risk measures, circuit breakers, you know, at downstream protocols, right? Uh, potential to think about a history of reserves on chain. I'm not sure if you'd call it a credit rating or a proof of reserve sort of rating, right? But history is important in this space, right? It's not always just a point in time measure. Yeah, and so the result here is that tokenized assets and markets can achieve the full potential, right? If we're going to eat TradFi, if we're going to eat into market share of GLD or uh, you know other sort of ETF traded markets, global macros, uh, publicly traded and private securities, uh, this type of automation has to be, has to be part of uh, these protocols. So I mentioned TrueUSD um, and the True Currency set. TrueUSD um, is proving reserves in real time. So this is a view of Trust Explorer, right? So this is Armanino as an independent third party pulling this data together, aggregating it, making it visible to everybody. Uh, and then also publishing a test reporting on top of it. So any of you guys can go to Trust Explorer, search that, find the true USD page, and download an attest opinion. Um, but more than that, uh, we're also providing an API of those key data sources, right? So total token circulating, uh, total dollar value of collateral, and a timestamp onto Chainlink. Um, we're also happy to participate in the Chainlink network as a validator, too. That's a pretty cool sort of uh, vertical step for us, right? But um, shows our, our, our deep interest in participating in the actual network side of this as well. 
Um, right, so with on-chain POR, I think trust uh, is higher, can be heightened, uh, can be increased, can be more transparent, and then automation becomes more possible. Again, more things can be built um, with proof of reserves data coming on chain. And so uh, in a perfect world, we solve these problems. We have a test reporting and PORs on, are on chain. I think I'm out of time, but uh, I appreciate you all joining and listening. Thanks. <laughs>